Christopher Constant or even Felix could make it even one day in the shoes of a any one of your employees, the dishwasher, the waiter, the line cook? Um, I would like to see Mr. Constant take orders from customers. I think that Ooh. would be a good start. As long as they don't point that. <laughs> because, you know, because it is a hard job. It's a very hard job, and people do not understand that the respect that is due to the food service workers right. in all areas yeah. from the kitchen. I started out as a busser. I worked in the kitchen. I worked myself all the way up because my dad <laughs> said, if you're going to take over this restaurant, you need to be able to do every job in this restaurant. If you can't, you're never going to make it. So that's why restaurant owners are very passionate. They Most of them have made their way up through it. We're, we're I, I did want to say one other, a couple other things, though, as far as statistics, because I was cut short before. We've had over 2.5 million people walk through the doors. Wow. And um, even though when you're looking at 50 years, we've had over six generations of families come into La Mesa. Come through that door. Six generations. I had a, I got an email a few days ago from, uh, it was a Facebook message from a gal in Portland, and she said, I just heard you're closing, and please tell me if that's true, because we will get on a plane tonight and be there tomorrow so we can have our last oh, meal at Lomax. Gosh. I'm getting inundated with, with people. We, I met my husband there. We have three kids. We bring them in. They, Someone posted they were on a blind date and they met. They've been married for 35 years. Do you think Christopher Constant or even Felix could make it even one day in the shoes of a any one of your employees, the dishwasher, the waiter, the line cook? Um, I would like to see Mr. Constant take orders from customers. I think that Ooh. would be a good start. As long as they don't point that. <laughs> because, you know, because it is a hard job. It's a very hard job. And people do not understand that the respect that is due to the food service workers right. in all areas yeah. from the kitchen. I started out as a busser. I worked in the kitchen. I worked myself all the way up because my dad <laughs> said, if you're going to take over this restaurant, you need to be able to do every job in this restaurant. If you can't, you're never going to make it. So that's why restaurant owners are very passionate. They Most of them have made their way up through it. We're, we're I, I did want to say one other, a couple other things, though, as far as statistics, because I was cut short before. We've had over 2.5 million people walk through the doors. Wow. And um, even though when you're looking at 50 years, we've had over six generations of families come into La Mesa. Come through that door. Six generations. I had a. I got an email a few days ago from. Uh, it was a Facebook message from a gal in Portland, and she said, "I just heard you're closing, and please tell me if that's true because we will get on a plane tonight and be there tomorrow so we can have our last oh, meal at Lomax." Gosh, I'm getting inundated with, with people. We. Bus. I met my husband there. We have three kids. We bring them in. They, someone posted they were on a blind date and they met. They've been married for 35 years. Uh, Paul is the owner of the Carousel Lounge. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. You know, we were we opened up two years ago. The business has been there since 1967. So it's a staple of Spinard. You know, we brought it back to life. The crew we brought in loves the Carousel Lounge. The customers come there, that's their bar. And we were doing gangbusters up through March. And when March hit, um, you know, we realized was, we had to make some sacrifices. We did what we had to do, and um, we shut down. We lost. We had 16 employees. We dropped down to zero, and we did what we had to do. Uh, we reopened up, and they let us open up with five employees. Uh, through that time, we had it got harder and harder. We had my manager ended up having a stroke. We had a couple bad situations with suicides, as I've mentioned before. We had uh, one marriage fall apart. Other relationships fall apart. It's been brutal. Well, and that's the side of this that the assembly, I mean, they look at, well, it's the sacrifice. It's not, you know, someone made the comment, which I thought was very well stated, that they're not, they're not making a sacrifice. They have been a sacrifice. Yeah. From our leaders, I would have liked to have seen less science and more sacrifice. I would have liked to have seen, we'll sacrifice our paychecks, take a cut, cut the MOA salaries, do something to lead us. Right. It's, it is a business, but at the same time, you you know, you get to you get to know their lives, and my my partner Linda, um, she has just been doing a great job bringing the whole crew together.
and to see them all scattered, we're down to five now. We're going to open, hopefully, on the first with four people. And, you know, they all, they all have rents. They all have expenses. They all have, some have kids. It's just been absolutely brutal on them. I go into apartments every day, and I walk in, and I see a single mom, three kids, out of work. The kids are on these laptops. She can't figure out the internet. That's that's where we're at. Trying, and she's the. That's just one example. I've got about six or seven tenants, or three to four thousand dollars behind in rent. To be fair, United Way, Catholic Social Services, Lutheran Services has been, has been helping. Uh, I've been working with my tenants to keep them in because I don't want to lose them. Um, but they're lost. I mean, they, they just don't know where to go. There's nothing, and, and nothing they can do about it. And, right? and, I mean, and to be fair, there's some. It, it's weird because you've got. You know, some that are suffering so bad, and some that are not, everything's fine. And you see this dichotomy where how we split up this, this lockdown, where half the company thinks nothing's going wrong, and half are think it's life's falling apart. So it's not affecting this half over here. They don't see it. And I hope we get that across tonight, how brutal it is. Probably one of the most memorable of 2020 was all of the hockey kids standing outside ringing their cowbells. I mean, hockey in this town came under. It's such a huge sport. How many How many kids, how many adults are participating now out on the ice? Oh, adults, that's a whole other story, but uh, kids, you're looking over 2,500 just in the municipality. All right. Um, when, you, when you take the rinks away from, from them or you put restrictions on them, because a lot of the kids, they're, they're either not playing for one of two reasons. Either A, their parents don't want to comply with the standards and jump through all the hoops to make it work, which sucks. And the masks, the, the masks. locker room issue, right? right? And they're being asked, like you're, you're, you as a mom with a four-year-old kid coming into the rink, you're being told you're, you cannot be in the rink while your kid's on the ice with a bunch of strangers. Yeah, which is just think about that. I mean, you when you look at sports in in the United States, I know as a figure skating coach, right? We take what's called safe sport, yep. and you're told all the time multiple adults need to be there, right? It's keeping the kids safe. It's it's all these protocols that are set in place, and now you're asking a parent to send their kid, regardless of how young they are, go into the rink by yourself at Ben Boki, where we have a huge homeless problem that's taken over, and now you're gonna send that kid in the rink by themselves and hope that the hockey coach that's on the ice can now keep an eye or keep track of all these kids that are out there? Yep. And these kids that are already in OCS, who are already in this limbo, right? Trying to find a permanent home, or maybe it is more contact with a parent that is trying to improve their life or whatever it is. I think um, what we need to remember is that kids come into custody because, um, because they experience trauma. And when they're already experiencing um, trauma and the impacts, and then you throw them into unpredictable things and um, exacerbate their mental health, we're not gonna get great outcomes. Um, when you take away visits um, from their birth parents, they can't reunify as, as quick. When, um, when the courts are shut down, we can't hold trials and we can't um, get kids to permanency quick. Um, we, cannot, um, uh, we can't support our workers because our workers are quitting all the time. We can't, um, we, you know, Alaska uh, has the highest rate of substance abuse related neglect and domestic violence in the nation. Right. And um, when we have decision makers that are afraid to, um, to delve into things um, to help protect kids um, because they've lost perspective, um, it, it has a huge impact on the very kids that that affects. And so it's, um, it's shocking, it's alarming, you know, I've, I've seen recent um, news stories about mental health and suicide rates that say that um, it's not happening at a higher rate. I would challenge people to look into those. I would challenge them. Our mental health hospitals are surging. Our, there's services that are surging that, that it's, it's hard to, to get kids the help they need. It's hard to get, it's hard to get the parents the help they need because of the complications. COVID has a cause all these complications, it's magnified it. It's magnified it to the point that people are on a tipping. They are tipping over the edge. And my concern is that the decision makers have lost perspective. Um, my family member was in a Providence Ex Extend Care, and he has been there for two years. We knew he was gonna stay there. Right, okay. Um, but we, when the whole lockdown happened, they were telling us that we couldn't come visit him. And just like anybody else in these Providence Extended Cares or any kind of um, nursing home, you can't go visit the people. But the people that work there can go in and out. 
neighbors. Right. But so you know, we talked about that. I mean, the hospital workers are going home, mm -hmm. back home to their family yeah. members all, all the time. Yep. Yes. And um, even in this specific uh, housing that he was in, we didn't even really see any kind of outbreak. Every once in a while, maybe there was one case here and there. And so the only options we had were to try to FaceTime with him or call him on the phone yeah. or bring, they bring him up to a window. So when's the last time your family got to see him in so person? I think face my, to face. So it was my grandpa, so it was my dad's dad. And he got to see him probably two months ago, three months ago, through a window. Wow, through yeah. a window. Yeah. Yeah, and I've heard from other people that are in the same situation and their parents are in this property, you know, not even Providence, any nursing home, and they have dementia. And so they don't even really understand what's going on. They don't mm -hmm. understand why they can't walk through the door and come see them. Right. So your your grandfather, ultimately, I mean, he, he passed away. Our condolences to your family. Um, but he passed away here a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I think it was, I'm trying to remember, I think it was the first week of December, the second week of December, somewhere in there. Um, we were told that he was stopped, he stopped eating and drinking. And so my, we asked, well, can we just at least have his wife come? My grandma of like 50 years, his wife, um, can she just come in and she'll wear whatever you want her to wear. Right. Yeah. And she could just hold his hand and, um, yeah, I mean, to go, to go through that. And I mean, you do, you take these family members have been there and then for him to just say, well, I'm not going to eat and drink, but it's been, when you go that many months and you can't see your family or you're looking at them through a glass, what a, I mean, we, we talk about those last moments of someone's life and how important those are for family to be able to have closure, right? Whether that's for them to be able to say, I love you one more time, mm -hmm. whether it's an, a, an opportunity for a family member to you know, make amends on something, whatever that is, and the stories that are happening all the time yeah. of what your family has just gone through. Well, this time last year, we were in California. I was able to go Vacation. see my, my mom for the first time in about 15 years, wow. um, and it was an amazing trip. Um, the restaurant let me take off all the holidays, which had never happened before because that's usually against the rules, but we were staffed enough, and everyone wanted to make money, and they said, you know what? You've been here almost 11 years. We're gonna let you have this vacation. And I, I was in California for three weeks, and it was amazing. So you had the job security, the job, ability all of to take the time off, yeah. right? Used my credit cards. Shouldn't have done that. All right. So now, fast forward to now. I mean, you're working at Simon Seifert. You mentioned you've been there 11 years. Yep. Now, 12 you, February. 12 years in February. Yep. Wow, that is that is phenomenal. Um, when we talk about employees that become like family, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's Amber, that is the epitome of it. But talk to me now. I mean, you've lost, you've you've completely lost your work. Yes. Wiped out. I mean, it's there's so many layers to all of it. Um, the biggest thing is I've been on an unemployment and I've been out of work for nine months. Luckily, I've. Uh, because I've worked full time since I was 15, I was able to get that unemployment. A lot of people in this industry, if they hadn't worked for a long time or whatever their circumstances were, you're not always eligible. You don't, you know, most of us don't right. have that security blanket. So that's why I've been going to the assembly meetings and that's why I've been going to my community council meetings and just fighting and trying to have a voice for all of these industry workers because a lot of them don't know the system. I didn't know the system nine months ago, but I'm I'm the type of person that I, I saw what was happening right from the beginning and it was so wrong at the core. Did you ever even think a year ago that you'd be sitting here today being forced to collect unemployment? Uh, no, and, and I've always, I've worked my whole life to stay and get out of poverty. My family was really poor growing up and um, for them to push me back when I've fought so hard to get where I am is really devastating. Right. Amber, you talk about, you know, you, you work so hard to come out of the very situation, to come out of poverty, off of unemployment, to the, you know, they've now forced you into the same situation that you busted your butt to get out of. Talk since to, I was 15. Talk to me yeah. about that struggle since you were 15. Walk, walk us through what that looked like for you at 15. Um, you know, I moved up to Alaska when I was 10. My dad was in the Coast Guard. And so I got separated with, from him when I was three. So I was raised in California. And then when my sister passed, 
she was an infant, I kind of got separated. My family fell apart. My stepdad and mom were drug addicts. So I came up to Alaska and my dad was kind of on the same, my biological dad was on the same path. So I had a hard time living with him because I didn't know him really. And I went to Wella Crest and my teachers, my counselors, if I hadn't had school, um, I, I can't say that I'd be sitting here right now. So I just want to stress how important it is to get our kids back in school because they, like kids like me at that age, I can't imagine them being in a living situation, fresh from another state, living with new parents and not having school. Okay. And be, you know, so I- so schools but kept you grounded kept during me grounded. Those other times. I still got in a lot of trouble, but I turned things around at 15 when I started working at Lucky Wishbone. 15 years old. 15, and I, I had to drop out of West High, and I had to start going to save because I was so behind on credits. So I made up four years of high school in two years, graduated with wow. a scholarship. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was getting in a lot of trouble during those years as well, but because I had that job, George and Peg Brown from Lucky Wishbone, I mean, you know, he's a veteran, bless his heart, he's... He put a work ethic in me and gave me a second family. And that's what rest, I've been working in restaurants ever since. And um, I worked at Boys and Girls Club for a little while, but I also waited tables. And restaurants are, restaurants are people. Restaurants are a family for people who don't have a family. And, and what's happening right now is t like, it's, it's terrible. You have people are really, yeah, you. yeah. And so I, I, I'm fighting to get restaurants back and to help people that are in my situation now that I was in then hope. They're right. hopeless. There's a lot of really hopeless yeah, people and, out there. And you know, outside of any check that anyone could write someone, right? I mean, you talk about your struggles and overcoming that to where you became, you know, you overcame poverty, you became independent, you became self-sufficient and now at, through no cause of your own, someone literally rips that right out from underneath you and is trying to tell you, this assembly is trying to tell you, well, you should be content. You've got unemployment. We might get you more cares. You should be just fine because you're going to sacrifice, sacrifice on, uh, you know, behalf of all this. They haven't given up any of their paycheck. No. And, and they, they assume that I can just go get another job. Just go get another job. Why can't you get a job? Oh, I don't know because my kids aren't in school. My husband works during the day full time. Who's going to homeschool my kids and who's going to take care of my kids if I have to get a day job? The other crazy thing I want to mention is a lot of uh, the back of the house staff, they're, they're, a lot of them have spouses that work in restaurants too. So now you have an entire household out of income. I mean, it's so common for servers in back of the house to have matches and make families and now, you know, I just, I can't imagine if both my husband and I were in this industry. So, I mean, I, my heart goes out to so many families. And Simon's, just so everyone knows, might not stay open. Yes. Do you really think that Christopher Constant, Felix Rivera, Forrest Dunbar, Austin Quinn Davidson could even make it even one shift in your shoes? Mm -hmm. They probably leave in tears. <laughs> just from the way that the chefs would say, I, you ordered that wrong, you can't modify that. You're not allowed to point yeah. at me, though. Oh, yeah, so that's a yeah. constant big thing, right? You're not allowed oh. to point at me. Don't say my name at all. I could not imagine. I'd like to see it. I could not imagine Christopher Constant. I think it would be hilarious. I want to see them have to spend even one day in the shoes of those who they have wiped out of work is they're still collecting their paychecks. So, so Trina, yeah. I want to talk to you the other night at the assembly meeting. Typically, you get three minutes to testify at the assembly meeting. Uh, the assembly only gave you two minutes to testify. I will tell you, um, I've stood up there, obviously, myself and testified numerous times. I followed politics for years. And your testimony was by far one of the most compelling I think I've ever seen. Ever. I mean, it was the, the, the numbers were unbelievable. The amount of money you've pumped into this economy. Well, I went through, I tried to come from a historical point because I was told that the assembly has reached a point where they're not listening anymore. They're hearing the same stories, the same statistics, the same, even if it's the same people telling different stories, they're not paying attention. They're up there on their phones. They're Googling who you are, what you, what you are doing. And so I thought, 
maybe if there was a way that I could come across and give some statistics on not just how many people are affected and have been affected, but then the amount of money that have, has reached across the world and across through through the state and the city of Anchorage. Um, my opening, one of my opening statistics was that we've had over $240 million in revenue come through the $240 door. million. And we're a family-owned restaurant. We're, yeah. we're not, uh, we're not obviously Simon and Seaforts. We're not a uh, chain restaurant. You've, you've got the franchises. And to, over a span of 50 years, obviously three restaurants. But what, when you break down that $240 million, that, the effect of that, that how many times over that $1 has gone through. Now, mind you, when I held up the first menu of, that my dad scribbled his, uh, his uh, uh, signature on, it, the price of a, they had 10 items. That was their first, very first menu when they first opened. And you could get... What we charge right now, sixteen dollars for, was a dollar forty-five. Wow! So exponentially <laughs> right. over time, two hundred and forty million dollars. If you were to probably break that out in today's prices, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I have the number for that. Mm -hmm. Add a few zeros, you know, yeah. thirty-five million, three billion. I don't know, right. but it's just the the value of that dollar and how it's trickled down to the employees and um, how much wages we've paid, how many nonprofits we've donated to. Um, it's well over a thousand. I originally in my testimony, I said 700 and I went back and I started. So more than a more. thousand, more than a thousand nonprofits. And I how guarantee it? you that any nonprofit that has been around uh, prior to the year 2000, from anywhere from 1970 to 2000, say five, we've donated to them. I would almost guarantee because there was a time where we would get hundreds and hundreds of requests for donations, and it would just we would put them out the door because we truly believe you, 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 you give back what you take in. Right. So two hundred and forty million dollars in revenue over the course of those years, donations to more than a thousand nonprofits. Before COVID started, I had thirty-five employees. Um, the hard thing what's happened over the past 10 months now is people start getting used to either not working, they start getting used to unemployment, they start getting used to the government giving them money, which is understandable for some people that are not um, wanting to work every single day. They find ways to adapt to less money taking unemployment and not working. So the struggle that we have right now is I, I have a key group of employees um, that are still with me that I never put on unemployment from the beginning and, the, and they're still with me. But my nine oldest employees that have been with Lamex um, have, a, have a total of over 220 years working with wow. Lamex. Wow. That's an average of 24 years per employee. I started in the business when I was eight years old and I worked on up and in 1980, um, a guy, excuse me, a, a guy by the name of Don started in the kitchen, and he's still with me. Wow. And, and having them not have jobs is the big struggle for me. Yeah, well, it's difficult. A lot of families work in in restaurants and mostly the Asian restaurants and, and the Mexican restaurants you might have three or four employees that are all related and so not only do they work at your restaurant but they they also have second jobs because they're either trying to provide for their extended family or they're trying to do what they wanted to do in the first place which is come to America for the American dream and to be able to work and right. so when you have when you have that trickle down effect that goes down through the employees, you know, one thing I want, uh, you mentioned this earlier, um, I would love, I would challenge any assembly member to come to my restaurant and any other restaurant and try to work a shift. 
next to one of our employees and get to know that employee, get to know that person from the dishwasher to the manager. Their stories are all across the board. They come from all different walks of life, all different families. There's no way that they can sit up there and make rules and laws and mandate that we cannot work and we cannot come to work when they are God to us. It's right. not right and it's not fair. What they're saying to us is, you are on the bottom, therefore you don't count. Trina, uh, you had some high profile people that have been into the restaurant. Share with me one next, because this is history that you don't get back. Yeah, so I'll start with, um, if you're over probably 50, you would remember these names. Uh, Wolfman Jack, um, the night special, yeah. he came into Lamex. Johnny Cash came into Lamex. Ah, good old Johnny Cash! His Woo! wife, uh, Kenny Rogers, oh, came wow. in. Robert Redford oh. came in. Oh. Um, and A lot of women showed up that night, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they did. Yeah. Um, we did have Ron Reagan Jr. come into wow. Lamex wow. Spinard, and um, his Secret Service mm -hmm. came in first and said, uh, we have somebody that would like to dine, but you need to clear your restaurant. And we were like, we're not going to close our restaurant for somebody. Who is it? And then it was like Ron Reagan Jr. Like, everybody out. <laughs> everybody clear the place. Ron so, needs to go. Yeah, oh right? yeah, so his secret service came in, and um, and that was exciting. And then uh, Jack Lemon, who starred with Marilyn right. Monroe. Yeah. And then most recently, Drew Barrymore came in. and oh, just a few years back. Just a few years ago. In fact, if you watch the movie all about whales, you will see the tables, the chairs, the lampshades, and the artwork in their restaurant scene came from the Lamex on Spinard. Oh, wow, I didn't know those. that. Yeah, they rented uh, plastic tables for us, and we had a sign that said, uh, pardon our plastic tables, but Drew Barrymore is borrowing them. <laughs> <laughs> more thing. I made a comment uh, to one of the news uh, medias uh, back in May during one of the shutdowns, and I, it never got played, obviously, but I said, if we end up shutting our doors, it won't be because of COVID, it will be because of this mayor. And You're um, right. that's come out true. On. It's only, the only thing that's changed is we, we are adding because of the mayor and its assembly.